couple days ago, I was researching topics for this channel and I found this amazing true crime case from the 1980s. And I began researching it and the first thing that pops up is HBO Max has just released a six part docudrama called The Murder at the White House Farms. And it's covering this case. And so I'm like, oh great, I'll watch the first 10 minutes of the first episode. It'll give me a good mental picture for this story when I cover it on my channel. And I hit play on the first episode and literally stayed up all night night binge watching all six episodes it's so good the show is so good i already knew it was going to happen and i loved it the acting is incredible they have three actors from the game of thrones that are lead characters in the show and that's a big deal game of thrones is pretty epic too the next morning i opened my emails and sitting in my inbox is a message from hbo max saying hey we'd love it if you could help us promote our new show the murder at the white house farms and i i thought that was so funny i'm like that's a sign so I'd like to give a huge thanks to HBO Max for sponsoring today's video. The link to their brand new six part docudrama called The Murders at the White House Farms is in my description below, but be careful if you click on it, it is a very addicting show. And if you're still on the fence about it and you're like, I don't know if I wanna watch this or not. Well, the first story I'm covering today on my top three list is the murders at the White House farm. But before we get started, please invite the like button over to your house for a sleepover, and then while they're sleeping, buzz a square of hair off their head. All right, let's get into today's stories. At 3.26 a.m. on August 7th, 1985, a very distraught man called the police and he said, I think my father is in mortal danger. He lives down the road from me. I was just on the phone with him and it seems like something is totally wrong. Can you please go check on him? The police tell him to calm down and explain really what's going on here, what happened on the phone. And so the man, whose name was Jeremy, said his dad called him and he was talking about his daughter. So Jeremy's sister and her name was Sheila. And he's like, Sheila's gone crazy. She's gone berserk. And I think she has a gun. And Jeremy's telling police that he didn't know what his dad was talking about. And he's trying to get more information from his dad. He's like, what do you mean she's got a gun? What's going on over there? But at some point in this phone call with his father, the phone line just cuts out. And Jeremy's left with all these questions that have gone unanswered. He tried calling back, but it didn't go through. And that's when he called the police. The police asked Jeremy if he had heard any shots fired in the background before the phone cut out. And Jeremy says, no, but my sister is schizophrenic. She's got a bad temper. And she had been fighting with my parents all week, in particular with my dad. And right before the phone cut out, my dad sounded really scared, like something bad was about to happen or was happening. And so we need to get over there right now. And so the police say, okay, we're going to check it out right now. So they hang up with Jeremy and the police head down the road towards White House Farms where Jeremy's father lives. They park a little ways away from the house itself, safely behind a wall and some trees because they don't want to go too close in case Sheila really does have a gun and starts shooting at them. As the police are getting out of their vehicle, another car comes driving down the road from the same direction the police had come from. The police tell them to stop and the person gets out and it turns out it's Jeremy. He didn't live that far away and he comes running over and he's like, we gotta go in there. You have to go in there right now. And the police are like, we're not gonna do that. You stay with your car. Before the police were prepared to go into this house, they wanted to scope it out and get a sense of what was going on because they really didn't know anything about the house besides what Jeremy told them. So a small group of police officers goes behind this other building that's kind of adjacent to the White House Farms, but pretty close to the actual farmhouse. And they go around the backside and they peek around the corner and they start looking at the house and it's still dark outside. And there's a couple of lights on inside the house and there's no movement, there's no sound, and they're just staring at it. And then one of the officers notices movement or what he thinks is movement up in the second floor. And the group of them back up behind the building. They didn't wanna be seen. They were worried if Sheila saw them, it would trigger her to harm the other people in the house or harm herself. So they back up away from this building, making sure to stay out of sight of that second floor window and really out of sight of any of the windows on this farmhouse. 
and they go back to the intersection where the police cars are and where Jeremy is, and they decide they're gonna take the diplomatic approach. And so they call in a negotiator who with a bullhorn goes up behind that little building and they start calling out to Sheila, trying to get her to peacefully put her weapon down and come outside. But there's no sound in the house, there's no more movement in the house as far as anyone can tell. And this turns into a multi-hour long standoff where no one comes out of the house, no one goes into the house, and then the sun comes up and the police are starting to get frustrated. And so they eventually call the negotiator back and they say, okay, we're gonna need to make entry. A small group of police assaulters began making their way up towards the farmhouse. They get up to the door, it's locked. They try the other door, it's locked. All the windows are locked. And so they bring up a sledgehammer, smashed on the front door and they make entry into this hallway. They immediately make a right and they're getting ready to confront Sheila wherever she is, but they don't see her. They go all the way down this hallway and it opens up into the kitchen and hunched over the stove is a man who's clearly deceased who winds up being Jeremy's father. He had been shot to death and he's laying in the kitchen. So they find him, they scan the rest of the kitchen and they look all around the first floor and there's no one else down there. And this whole time, they're not hearing any other noises in the house. It's totally silent. They make their way upstairs and as soon as they get to the top of the stairs, they go right into the first room on the right and laying on the bed is a deceased older woman who's also been shot to death and that would wind up being Jeremy's mother. Laying on the ground next to the bed was a woman who appeared to be in her late 20s who would wind up being Jeremy's sister. So Sheila, the one who had gone berserk apparently according to the father, she's laying on the ground and she has a rifle that's over her chest and the barrel is pointed up towards her head and she has a gunshot wound that's going in underneath her chin. And so she's deceased as well. The police leave that room, they go across the hall into another bedroom. And when they go inside, they find two more bodies that are both laying in their beds. They were six-year-old twins. They were Sheila's sons. They had both been shot to death as well. After that, there was nobody else in the house. So all of the family has been wiped out. Very quickly, this case was labeled a clear-cut murder-suicide perpetrated by Sheila. She had a history of mental illness. She had apparently gone berserk that night and she had a gun, everything fit. And so the police were ready to just write this off as a murder-suicide, especially with the amount of media attention this case got. There was a lot of pressure to just solve this case and move on. And so murder-suicide became the answer, and they were not looking for any other answer. But there was one detective that was not willing to accept that this was clearly a murder-suicide, and he had a couple reasons for it. The first thing he noticed, because he was there when the bodies were discovered, was Sheila was carrying a rifle that had a 10-round magazine, and Sheila did not have any pockets on the clothes she had on when they found her. That's important because she fired 25 shots. So that required two reloads, except the ammunition to this gun was downstairs, and a lot of the shooting happened upstairs. So after her first volley of fire on the second floor, where presumably you have at least a couple people that are still totally alive, she had to walk downstairs, reload the gun, come back upstairs, do her second volley of fire, go back downstairs, reload that second time, and then she finishes her course of fire. And it made him wonder, why didn't anybody try to stop her while she was doing the reload? Because it required going all the way down, getting the rounds, jamming them into the magazine, putting it into the gun, and then going back upstairs. That's a lot of time that other people could have potentially tried to stop her, or at a minimum, just tried to escape but it was like everybody just laid in bed. It was like they didn't know what was happening despite so many rounds being fired very close to them. Stan also found out Sheila did not have extensive weapons training. And so she wouldn't be natural at reloading a weapon. And so for her to go down and reload twice and not chip any of her nails, she had long painted nails, that seemed like a bit of a stretch because that requires pretty coordinated movements. And for her to never have done that before and just to be able to easily reload, that seems like a stretch too. Stan also figured out there was a window that had a faulty latch on it that if you pulled lightly on it, it would stay locked. But if you pulled hard and kind of jostled it around, it could open and it could shut, which means the house was not secure when they got there, even though they thought it was. And that was a big part of their whole, this is a murder-suicide because Sheila locked all the doors and windows before she committed this crime. But if any of those doors or windows were open, it kind of leaves open the opportunity for someone else to have gotten in there and gotten out before the police. But the biggest discovery by far that puts all the others to shame is something Stan found under the stairs inside the house. 
and everything before that, all the evidence that Stan was presenting to the other officers saying, hey, we should take a look at this. I don't know if this is a murder-suicide. I think there might be potential for somebody else to be responsible. Well, no one was taking him seriously until he came to the table with what he found underneath the stairs. Everybody had to stop what they were doing and say, okay, yeah, we need to look closer at this. And so if you want to learn more about that, go ahead and click on the link inside of the description. It will bring you to the landing page where you can watch this series that I've been raving about. It's on HBO Max and it's called The Murders at the White House Farm. And it does a great job of showcasing this huge find and then the follow-on plot twist. On the morning of November 13th, 1974, six members of the DeFeo family were asleep in their home in Amityville, New York. The seventh member of the family, Ron, was sitting on his bed in the basement. At around 1 a.m., he gets up off his bed, he grabs a rifle, and he starts walking up the stairs. He goes across the first floor, goes up the second floor stairs, and he gets to the second floor landing, and he walks right into his parents' bedroom, which was totally dark besides this little candle that had been lit next to his father's bedside, and he raises his rifle and he puts two rounds into his father's back. And then as soon as his father is still, he aims at his mother and he shoots her two times. And then he puts the gun down and he walks out and he goes across the hall into his brother's room. He raises his rifle and he fires one shot into his 12 year old brother, Mark. And then he aims at his nine year old brother, John, and he fires one shot into him as well. Then he leaves their bedroom and he walks down the hall to another bedroom where he finds his 13 year old sister, Allison. He raises his rifle and he fires one shot. He leaves her room, he goes up the third set of stairs, up onto the third floor, he finds his 18-year-old sister Dawn, and he fires one shot into her, and then he was done. Altogether, it took Ron about 15 minutes to massacre his family. At no point was he panicked or running around or acting crazy. He was just walking calmly room to room, taking very well-aimed shots to ensure they didn't get up again. He put the rifle down and he went outside and he jogged to a bar where he went inside and he put on this big facade that he had just found his family and they were hurt and could you come help him? And when they got to the house, he refused to go inside, but the people from the bar went inside and they discovered this horrible scene. And when the police show up, Ron goes over to them and he actually confesses and says, I killed my family. Even though the DeFeo family had a reputation for being very dysfunctional, it was Ron who had the worst reputation. He was known around Amityville for heavy drug use, for being a total alcoholic, and for getting really aggressive and confrontational with people. He was just a guy no one wanted to be around. And so when news got out in Amityville that this horrible thing has happened, and it looks like Ron is the one who did it, no one was really that shocked. But when details of the crime scene, specifically the way the bodies were positioned, made people wonder, is there more to this case that we don't know about? All of the DeFeo family members had been found lying face down in their beds, and none of them showed any signs of putting up a struggle against their attacker, which led investigators initially to think that they must have been sedated, that Ron must have drugged them somehow before he carried out this attack. But when the toxicology reports came back, no one in the family had any substance in their system. At first, the police did not think that was a very big deal. They figured, you know what? The family just must not have heard the different gunshots. He wasn't shooting lots of rounds. It was, you know, one single round here, one single round here, that perhaps they just didn't hear it. And that's why no one tried to escape. But it turns out the rifle Ron was using, the 35 caliber Marlin, is one of the loudest rifles you can own. And in fact, investigators went out and did a test with it and they fired it indoors and you could easily hear it a mile away. And so investigators said, well, then it looks like they must have heard these gunshots, but for some reason didn't get out of their beds. They didn't try to fight back in any way. They just kind of took it. And then you have the weirdness of Ron's confession. On the night of the attack, when Ron is sitting on his bed and he can't sleep and everybody else is asleep upstairs, he starts hearing a voice in his head that's saying, catch them, kill them. And he thinks he's just losing his mind. But then out of the shadows, straight across from him, from underneath the steps in the basement, the shadowy figure emerges and starts walking towards him. And he can see what looks like its mouth moving and saying the words, catch them, kill them. And 
Ron's looking up at it as this figure walks all the way up to him and bends down and gets right next to his ear. And he says right into his ear, Catch them. Kill them. And then Ron said involuntarily he reached over to the rifle that was on the bed with him and he stood up and he began walking towards the steps. And he knew what was going to happen. He was going to go kill his family and he didn't want to do it. But he felt like he didn't have any more control over his body. And that's when he realized he was being possessed by this demon in the basement. While Ron's confession terrified everybody in Amityville, the idea that there was a demon living in the basement of this house that possessed someone to go kill their family, I mean, that terrified everybody. But it didn't hold up in court. And ultimately, Ron was sent to jail for life. One year after the attacks, another family, the Lutz family, moved into the house in Amityville. But they left 28 days later because they were hearing voices coming from the basement. After hearing about the mass murder that occurred in the house, and now the Lutz family saying that there's something in the basement, world-renowned demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, they descend on the property and very quickly Ed and Lorraine say, yes, this house is definitely haunted. And in fact, to this day, the Amityville house is considered one of the most haunted places in the entire world. But while Ed and Lorraine were there, they took a very famous picture. Lorraine was walking around the second floor near where the brother's room was, and she was snapping pictures. And the only people in the house at the time these pictures were being taken were her and her husband, Ed. And here is the picture that she took on the second floor. She claims this boy standing on the left side of the picture is the ghost of John DeFeo. Today, the house still stands and it's been bought and sold a number of times over the years because apparently no one likes to live in this house for a very long time. On June 10th, 1912, the Moore family was sleeping peacefully in their beds on their quiet street in Villisca, Iowa. Joe and Sarah Moore, the mother and the father, were asleep upstairs in their room, and their four children were down the hall in another room. In addition to the Moore family sleeping upstairs, there was also two more children sleeping on the first floor in the guest room. It was the Stillinger sisters, and they were over for a sleepover. And unbeknownst to all the sleeping people in the house, there was a strange man who had broken into the house while they were at church, gone into the attic, and was hiding in there, smoking cigarettes, and carrying an ax. Shortly after midnight, the stranger believed the coast was clear and they silently opened up the small door and they crouched down and walked out of the attic into the second floor hallway, wielding this ax in their left hand. They began walking down the hallway. They passed the children's room on their right and they made their way down to the end of the hall where the master bedroom was. They walked inside the room and stood right next to Joe and then violently raised the ax over their head so quickly and so high that it actually struck the ceiling and then brought it down blade first directly onto Joe's face over and over and over again until Joe did not resemble a human being. While this was happening right next to her, Sarah's beginning to stir and look around what's going on. Meanwhile, the killer has now moved to the other side of the bed and is standing over Sarah and using the back side of the ax. So not the blade part, but the back side of the ax head. He raises it up and then brings it down on her head and repeatedly hits her over and over and over again until she too is indistinguishable and does not look like herself or even human. The killer is very calm. He takes the sheets and pulls them up over the faces of both of the people he just killed. And then he goes back out into the hall and he walks down and he goes into the children's room. One by one, he raises the ax and drops the ax on each of the children's heads. And then after they are deceased, he pulls the sheets up over their head. The killer leaves the room and goes downstairs to where the Stillinger sisters are. And then just like everybody else in the house, he raises the ax and drops it over and over and over again on the heads of each of these girls until they're no longer living as well. Afterwards, he raises the sheets over their faces and now everyone in the house is deceased and has their face covered. At this point, the killer goes back upstairs and goes back into the master bedroom and he stands in front of Joe and Sarah's bed. And after a little while, he begins striking them dozens more times, even though both of them were clearly deceased at this point. At this point, the killer shifted gears and began focusing on covering his tracks, cleaning up. And he began taking clothes out of closets and pulling whatever sheets he hadn't used. He began tacking these things up onto all of the windows and any spaces on the doors so that nobody could see in. 
He also began covering up the mirrors, which no one understood why he did that. After the house is totally covered up, the killer goes into the kitchen and he cooks himself a meal, but he doesn't eat the food. He cleaned off the ax and placed it up against the wall on the first floor. He then took a huge bowl, filled it up with water, and then washed his bloody hands and began to clean himself a little bit. And then he left the bloody water just sitting on the counter. And then strangely, he took a huge slab of bacon from in the kitchen and he put it in the middle of the floor and then next to it was a keychain. And some people think this might have to do with some ritual he was performing, but to this day, no one really knows why he did that. And then he took some keys from inside the house, walked out the door, turned around, locked it behind him and disappeared. The Moore household normally was a very rambunctious place with all these kids running around and the neighbors were very close. And so the next morning when the neighbors did not see the Moore family coming outside to do their chores around 7 a.m., they were concerned and they went over and they knocked on the door. There was no answer. They noticed everything had sheets over it so they couldn't see inside. And so Joe's brother was hailed to the house and he brought along a key and he opened up the door and he walked inside and he immediately saw the Stillinger sisters and what had been done to them. And he got incredibly sick and he ran outside and they called police, police come down and they find this horrible scene. Even though they have the murder weapon, they have the victims, their bodies are right here. There's blood, there's all sorts of stuff and things that the killer must have manipulated. And you would think there's, there's enough here that you'd be able to refine your search to a couple different suspects and eventually figure out who did this, but they weren't able to. And to this day, we have no idea who did this. The house itself where the attack happened has not been updated since the attack. Somebody bought the property and then maintained it so it could be a tourist attraction. And so to this day, you can go to the Velisca Axe Murder House and you can stay there. You can sleep there overnight and you can actually tour the area and it looks the same way it did when the murders happened. Many people believe that house is haunted. And in fact, in 2014, someone who was there staying overnight as a tourist inexplicably stabbed themselves and had to go to the hospital and they don't even know why they did it. And so that's kind of added to the legend of the Velisca Axe Murder House, that the house itself will cause you to harm yourself. So that's gonna do it guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you found the secret in today's video, please tell us in the comments what it is and where you found it. And if you're the first to do that, we will pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button over to your house and while they're sleeping, buzz a small square of their hair off. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. Remember to click the link in my description to go watch the Murders at the White House Farm. It's an awesome show. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.